This video is part of a series that expands on the basics of historical linguistics by exploring various types of regular sound changes. Today's sound change is assimilation. Two sounds are involved here, and one of them becomes more like the other. The assimilating phoneme picks up one or more of the features of another nearby phoneme. The Latin root simil is the key here. The two sounds become more similar. You've learned about phonemes and their features in my series, The IPA for Language Learning. The place of articulation and manner of articulation of consonants will come in especially handy for the basics of assimilation. Let's take an example. The Latin phoneme D has the features dental, plosive, and voiced. The phoneme S has the features alveolar, fricative. The Latin word ad, prefixed to the word similatio, results in the pronunciation assimilatio. In other words, D comes to share all the features of the nearby S and is completely assimilated to S. Speakers of languages the world over use assimilation to make words easier to pronounce for ease of articulation. There are different types of assimilation. Does the assimilating sound take on every feature of the phoneme that triggered assimilation? If so, the assimilation is complete. If it only takes on some of, or even just one of the features, that's only a partial assimilation. The assimilation in the Latin assimilatio above is complete. But when I pronounce N as M before P in input, that's a partial assimilation. The two sounds are both bilabial, but one's a nasal and the other's a plosive. Are the two sounds side by side? We'll call that contiguous assimilation. Or are they more distant from each other, not adjacent? That's non-contiguous. The two examples of assimilation I have given you both involved contiguous phonemes. If my tongue gets twisted and I accidentally say uh, Russian submarine for Russian submarine, the assimilation is non-contiguous. Does the changed sound come after the sound it's assimilating to? That's a regressive assimilation. Or is it heard before the sound it's assimilating to? That would be a progressive assimilation. My embarrassing mispronunciation, Russian submarine, is an instance of a regressive assimilation. But the assimilation of N to P in input is a fine example of a progressive assimilation. We can also label assimilations by the features that are changed in the process. If the assimilating phoneme is originally voiceless, does it pick up the feature voice from the other sound? This sound change is called voicing. Nearly all vowels in human language are voiced. Consonants often become voiced between vowels. Some Italian speakers pronounce the phoneme s or s between two vowels as z, like in la mia casa my house, the change from S to Z is an instance of intervocalic voicing. If the assimilated phoneme is voiced, does it pick up the feature voiceless from the other sound, or from being at the end of a word? That's the opposite phenomenon called devoicing. So the word have ends in the voiced phoneme V. The word to begins with the voiceless T. Some speakers devoice V to F when they pronounce the expression have to as have to. Does the assimilating sound move its place of articulation closer to the palate? This happens when the sound it's assimilating to already has a palatal or near palatal place of articulation. This is called palatalization and its significant triggers include the consonant y and the vowel e. For instance, some English speakers pronounce the word student as student. In rapid speech, the alveolar t assimilates to the palatal y and becomes palatal alveolar ch, student. Does the assimilating sound change its manner of articulation so that the airflow is closer to a fricative? This is fricativization, and less restricted sounds trigger this kind of change, including fricatives and vowels. Stops often undergo this assimilation. I've both heard and said the mispronunciation up through for up through. 
That pronunciation fricativizes the plosive p as it assimilates to the fricative th. Of course, a phoneme can assimilate to any place or manner of articulation. I won't list all of them here. Further examples of assimilation to specific places of articulation include labialization when the assimilating sound becomes more labial and velarization when the assimilating sound becomes more velar. When it comes to manners of articulation, the assimilating sound can become a plosive, an affricate, and so on. There's an opposing change known as dissimilation. Two sounds are involved here too, but one becomes less like the other. The dissimilating phoneme loses one or more of the features it shares with another nearby phoneme. The two phonemes become more dissimilar as a result. The English phoneme p is a voiceless bilabial stop. If you say Peter Piper picked a peck of pickled peppers as fast as you can, chances are you dissimilate one or more p's by pronouncing them as an f. Here, f becomes less like the surrounding p's by turning from a stop into a fricative. But there are more serious examples in language history. The Latin root peregrin comes into English as pilgrim rather than pilgrim. The first R dissimilates to an L. Dissimilation has the same characteristics found in assimilation. They can be progressive or regressive, contiguous or non-contiguous, involve voicing or devoicing, etc. The one consistent difference is that this process involves two sounds becoming less alike. That's all for assimilation and dissimilation. Watch again next time when I'll go over the kinds of sound changes that involve adding and getting rid of sounds.